Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and in this video we will talk about post-term pregnancy, what that is, how it affects the mother and the baby and the medical aspect of a post-term pregnancy. We will also talk about labor induction as this is often recommended in post-term pregnancies. The normal length of a pregnancy is between 37 to 42 weeks. If a baby is born before the 37th week, it is called preterm. If a baby is born after the 42nd week, it is called postterm. So postterm pregnancy is one that is longer than 42 weeks or 294 days from the first day of the last menstruation. This is actually quite common. 10% of births occur postterm. So what can cause a post-term pregnancy? Actually, the most common reason for a post-term pregnancy diagnosis is inaccurate estimation of when the pregnancy started. To be exact, the inaccurate calculation of fertilization based on the first day of the last menstrual period is the most common cause of diagnosis of post-term pregnancy. To be able to reliably calculate the weeks of pregnancy, it is usually necessary to determine the gestational age early in pregnancy based on the first day of the last menstruation. At the same time, an experienced gynecologist should also perform a physical and sonographic examination. The calculated date of fertilization can vary from the actual day that the fertilization occurred. In cases where a woman has a very irregular menstrual cycle, ovulation may not have occurred in the same interval as the usual standardized cycle. And based on this, the actual week of pregnancy may vary from the calculated week of pregnancy. In pregnancies where ovulation and fertilization were able to be calculated correctly, the exact cause is usually difficult to pinpoint. But there are a few predisposing factors as for example, having had a post-term pregnancy before, or having a family history of post-term pregnancy, and a patient herself being born post-term. So post-term pregnancy basically means that a pregnancy is longer than normally. So what does that imply? A pregnancy that is longer than normal has a few risks for the fetus, but also the mother. One of the risks for the fetus is macrosomia. This refers to a birth weight of over 4 kg. In the time in the womb, the baby is continuously receiving nutrients and everything it needs and continues to develop and grow. So naturally, it will be larger at, for example, 44 weeks compared to, for example, 37 weeks gestation. A larger baby is more difficult to give birth to. And so prolonged labor, birth trauma, and shoulder dystopia, which means that during birth there's a problem to deliver the shoulder, are more common in post-term deliveries. Another risk is fetal dysmaturity. This is also called post-maturity syndrome and means that some babies will stop gaining weight after the due date, which is usually calculated to be at 40 weeks gestation. The stop of weight gain is usually associated with a decrease of blood delivery to the fetus via the placenta, leading to malnourishment. The babies usually present with arms and legs that seem skinnier and longer than normally, and the skin looks dry and sometimes starts to peel off a little bit. Also the hair and the finger and toenails are often longer than usually in term babies. Also a risk for the baby is the increased risk of stillbirth. The risk is still very small luckily, with around 4 to 7 deaths per 1000 births. But in comparison to babies born on term, it is slightly higher. In those it is 2 to 3 per 1000 births. The last risk for the fetus that I want to talk about is meconium aspiration. When the baby is in the uterus for more than 42 weeks, it is more likely to pass its first stool inside the womb. This first stool is called meconium and can cause breathing problems after birth 
if it gets into the lungs together with the amniotic fluid. Risks to the mother are usually related to the larger than normally baby and includes difficulties during labor. It increases the chance for rupture of the perineum, labia, rectum and vagina in a vaginal delivery. And in case of a cesarean delivery, the risk of bleeding, infection and injury to the surrounding organs is increased. And what is the medical approach to ensure optimal health for the mother and child? Usually certain tests are done if the pregnancy continues after the due date, so at around week 42. Included in these tests is the measurement of the amniotic fluid amount and the fetal heart rate, using a fetal monitor in a non-stress test. Here a device using ultrasound is placed and fixated on the mother's abdomen to measure the fetal heart rate for around 20 to 30 minutes. The average heart rate should be between 110 and 160 beats per minute and there should be increases of minimum 15 beats per minute for 15 seconds intervals during the whole duration of the test. Also, an ultrasound examination is usually done to see the baby's activity and see any signs of fetal post-maturity syndrome or any abnormalities. Here the fetal movements, breathing movements, muscle tone of the extremities and spine and the amniotic fluid amount is checked. Then points are given between 0 and 2. The higher the points, the better. So the maximum points that can be achieved are 10 points, indicating that everything is normal. These tests are usually done twice weekly from week 41 on. Sometimes a labor induction is recommended. The induction must be carefully considered and points as the cervical integrity, the health of the mother and baby, and changes in the vital signs of the baby play a key role in the decision if labor should be induced. Labor is usually induced if the benefits to either the mother or the child outweigh the continuation of the pregnancy and it can be induced post-term or also in earlier stages of the pregnancy. There are immediate conditions as rupture of the membranes with chorioamnionitis or a severe preeclampsia. Other indications that are more common include membrane rupture without progression of labor, gestational hypertension, non-reassuring fetal status, post-term labor and chronic diseases from before pregnancy, such as chronic hypertension and diabetes. Contraindications to induce labor are severe macrosomia, so if the child is too large to be born vaginally, multi-fetal gestation, so if there are more than one baby, severe hydrocephalus, so a large amount of water that is accumulated within the skull of the baby, which can pose a risk for vaginal delivery, malpresentation of the fetus, and a few maternal contraindications, such as a prior uterine incision, a narrow pelvis, abnormal placentation such as placenta previa, or active infections such as genital herpes or also cervical cancer. Sometimes also a mother has the wish for a labor induction. This has become more prevalent in the last years. Labor induction can be a successful measure to actually induce labor. But many factors are influencing if after an attempt to start labor, it will actually start within the next hours. Such factors include the body mass index below 30 for the mother and the birth weight of the fetus below 3.5 kg. Also the status of the cervix is important and can be rated with a Bishop score. In the Bishop score, factors as the positioning of the cervical opening, the cervical consistency, effacement and dilation and the station at which the baby's head is found are evaluated and graded with 0 to 3 points each. With a Bishop score of 9 or more points, the cervix is determined as favorable for induction or continuation of labor. A Bishop score of 4 or less is usually said to be unfavorable for induction of labor and other measures such as cervical ripening can be considered.
One way to induce labor is by administering prostaglandin E1. It can be either applied vaginally or orally. Prostaglandins help the cervix to dilate and for contractions to occur. After the administration of prostaglandins, it can take up to five days for labor to start, as the cervix usually dilates slowly. Another way to induce labor is by mechanical techniques, such as the transcervical Foley catheter. Here, a small catheter is passed through the cervical opening and then inflated. After it is inflated, it is slowly and carefully moved downwards, creating a tension that can help the cervix to dilate and efface, so to become thinner. Another way to induce labor is by hygroscopic cervical dilators. Hygroscopic means that it absorbs water. Here an around 4 mm device is introduced into the cervix. It will be left there for many hours and slowly takes up water from the surrounding tissues, which will cause it to dilate and so slowly open the cervix. Another measure is the membrane stripping, also called membrane sweep. Here a gloved finger is introduced by the doctor into the vagina and through the cervix, just below the uterine wall and the amniotic membrane. With the finger carefully the amniotic membrane is separated from the uterine wall, which can induce labor and sometimes also lead to the rupture of the amniotic membrane, which also will accelerate labor. The membrane sweep helps to release prostaglandins, which then again help to dilate and efface the cervix. Sometimes also synthetic oxytocin is used. It potentiates uterine contractions and can help with labor induction and progression when labor has already begun. When oxytocin is administered, the fetal heart rate should be monitored to see any signs for fetal distress or acceleration of the heart rate. Oxytocin is very effective and the contractions usually start around half an hour after oxytocin is given intravenously. The last way to induce labor I will talk about is the amniotomy. It is the surgical rupture of the membranes, which is very effective in inducing labor quickly. To minimize the risk of umbilical cord prolapse, so that the umbilical cord falls into the birth canal and gets compressed, a fundal or suprapubic pressure should be applied. Before and immediately after an amniotomy, the fetal heart rate should be monitored. That's it for this video. Thank you for watching. I hope it was helpful. And if you like our channel, please subscribe. Hopefully see you again in the next video.